everyone, welcome to Charity Village Presents The World is Bright in partnership with Story Money Impact. My name is Mary Barrell from Charity Village. And I'm Anthony Trung Swan, the Outreach Director and Impact Producer at Story Money Impact. With Charity Village Presents, we'll be bringing you impact films that shine the light on issues that nonprofits and charities across Canada work every day to help solve and improve by bringing support to causes and people in need. And at Story Money Impact, we use films about urgent issues to emotionally connect your constituencies and your communities with your activities and your causes. So it's film is this truly excellent way of building awareness, but then building engagement with the audience that has come to learn about the issue. Today we feature The World is Bright, a film that explores the challenges confronting immigrants who want to build a life in our country, the cultural stigma that sometimes exists around mental illness, and how the lack of mental health support to new Canadians can turn a journey of hope into a tragedy. This film was shot over an incredible 10 year period, uh, showing an incredible amount of trust between the protagonists of the film and the documentary filmmaker you're going to meet today. It's tender, it's powerful, and it helps us understand how the intimacy and details of this immigrant experience from the perspective of two parents from Beijing who are on this journey to understand the suicide of their only child in Vancouver after he migrated there to start a new life in Canada. We have a clip from the film, The World is Bright. So let's take a look. Hide Joining us today is the filmmaker Ying Wang from Richmond, BC, a city with one of the highest new immigrant populations in Canada. As an immigrant herself, Ying is fascinated with the emotional and geopolitical complexities of global migration. Her film, The World is Bright, has won the Sea to Sky Award at the 2019 Vancouver International Film Festival and the Emerging Canadian Filmmaker Award at the 2020 Hot Dogs Canadian International Documentary Film Festival. Um, I'm also very honored to uh, say that joining us is also Dr. Jasmine Brewster, who is an incredible expert within this field of transcultural psychiatry. She's a professor within the Division of Social and Transcultural Psychiatry at McGill, uh, the Department of Psychiatry. And she is currently working with Indigenous children and youth mental health and the Victoria Immigrant and Refugee Center for Southern Vancouver Island. And she continues to be a trainer, a researcher, has global health projects in Jamaica since 2005, teaching in Nepal, India, Brazil, and Italy, and is an artist herself. Such impressive guests. Welcome to you both. Ying, I was deeply moved by your extraordinary film and the tenderness that you used in exploring the heart-wrenching experience the parents endured. But I wanted to start out by uh, asking Anthony perhaps to identify uh, what it was about uh, the world is bright as being a film that SMI really thought would be great to work with in the kind of work that you do with the sector. 
Thank you, Mary. That's such a great question. It's super nuanced, but I will try to keep it brief. Um, at Story Money Impact, the core of our work is this belief that people are more likely to engage in action, meaningful action, if they are emotionally engaged in the issue. So stories are one of the oldest and most powerful ways to get someone uh, to give their heart to you. So we use our films to tug on their heartstrings. And at that moment, when, they're, when they stand up in the audience and they ask, well, what can I do? It's then our job to have a very clear call to action for them. And we develop those calls to action by working with these nonprofits who have expertise working in that issue for decades. So this film, we saw clips of it at our impact lab in 2018. And as uh, a young, as a child of refugees myself, I had never seen the kind of grief and sorrow that the parents expressed in this film uh, in, in my life personally. I'd never seen my parents express it. I'd never seen any of my family members express it. And there's something so powerful about these courageous parents who came to Canada and experienced all the same things their son experienced, the social isolation, the culture shock, the, the challenges of navigating a bureaucratic system when you don't speak the language. And we knew that we wanted to share this film with as many people as possible so, so that they could understand the importance of mental health awareness because in immigrant communities, it's such a, uh, an obstacle to even begin that conversation. So we saw it as an excellent tool and so far it really has been, but I can talk about that later. Well, we want to join you in actually bringing that story to a broader audience. And Ying, I, I have to say, I was really struck by the title, The World is Bright, actually being the translation of the son's name, uh, because it reflected so well the hopes and dreams that the parents had for their son, and how their bright world uh, became so dark with the dis discovery of his death. Can you tell us what it was about this family story that inspired you to make your film? Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for showing the film. It's really our great honor to be part of this. Uh, I would say what inspired me to make the film uh, was actually first my personal connection with the story. Uh, I grew up in Beijing and uh, my family immigrated to the United States with a hope for a better life. But uh, after the immigration, my sister developed a severe eating disorders. So when I, the time when I know the parents in Vancouver, mental illness had already been a subject that very close to my heart. Um, but what motivated me to finish the film after so many years is that the more we dig deep into the story, the more complexity, complexity uh, of the issues it revealed in front of us. And uh, this complexity connection between the immigration and the mental illness, uh, that is uh, make the story unique. However, at the same time, also make it very universal. So the uniqueness, uni the universal, and also the complexity behind all this, um, you know, you still cannot see this type of story on many mainstream media in Canada, although Canada is a country, uh, you know, made up of immigrants. So, so we, we thought if we didn't finish the film, if we don't make the film, nobody else would make it. So I think that's what motivated us to finish it, regardless how hard it was. One of the themes of the film was the cultural stigma associated with mental illness and the isolation of the immigrant in their adopted country. Dr. Guzder, is this a common experience among immigrants to Canada? Homogenous answer for what's common in Canada because we're such a diverse society. So one of the things that we have to stay away from is stereotyping or suggesting that one story reflects everyone's story. 
there are many stories and stigma is something that is very common in our society, even in the dominant culture, but also people bring with them very complex reasonings about stigma or experiences, uh, uh, as well as uh, feeling that it may inhibit their process as a refugee for furthering their settlement or not understanding how to access help and all sorts of other related issues. So it's a complex sort of uh, agenda. Doctor, I wonder if you could explain what the vulnerabilities to possibly suffering mental illness that the act of the immigration actually create? Well, we do know that, um, that immigration by itself is, can be very stressful uh, for many people because of pre-migration trauma. So even before you come to the country, then the process itself of separating, especially when you lose family connection or other kinds of, of issues. And we know that rates of mental illness are, are higher in, because of this immigration distress. And this, is, uh, in, this has been well researched across Europe uh, and, and America and Canada. So we do know that there's also different kinds of vulnerabilities. This young man fits into the age group also where we have more risk of first episode psychosis, which we have in young people up to the age of 25. So he can't, comes into several categories of increased his risk and uh, may have made uh, contributed to this language, uh, the difference of cultures, uh, the isolation from his family, the developmental stage of his life and his, and his fears about reaching out and the shame and stigma of, involved. And that was very uh, subtly shown in the film because it had a generational resonance. In fact, the, the figure of the grandmother and protecting the grandmother from a catastrophic grief was one of the cultural idioms that is very common in Asian society to protect elders from certain kinds of issues by, by not speaking to them. So there are many things which were evident in this film which are related to that question. Um, I want to touch on something that you mentioned, Dr. Guster, about how there's such a diversity of experiences in Canada. And I think something that we have to give credit to is that there are so many different ways to experience immigration itself. Some people do come to Canada to seek out a new life, um, but some people come to Canada for education, like Shiming did, who was an international student. Some people come as uh, migrant workers, and that's a very different experience. For international students like Shimeng, um, the protagonist of the film, you know, they have very little support because they're traveling to this new culture and this new country without their family at a crucial point of their development into adulthood. Um, Ying, I wanted to ask you, um, did you get a sense from the people you interviewed that his death could have been avoided if there had been more mental health support for him or more mental health awareness by him and the people around him? Yeah, indeed. Uh, because uh, I would add that the support uh, is also a very co complicated system and that the family plays an equal role, important role as community, as well as an institution, like a hospital. And sometimes, uh, you know, for Asian culture, which family, you know, is so important. So the, the role of family is even more important. So during the, the course of the journey, uh, what the father, expre uh, he expressed the most is that uh, he regretted that his lack of knowledge of mental illness made him couldn't give the support to Shi Ming when Shi Ming needed badly. So this became his most regret. Uh, I would also add, indeed, there is a reason the study has shown that international student is actually the group that is most unlikely to seek help when they encounter uh, and the suffering of mental illness. And we've heard that from many 
students from SFU and UBC who have seen this film and then reached out directly to you to say, this is my experience and this is the first time I've seen the story told. And we've had this opportunity to send them to you know, nonprofits like CMHA and uh, Mosaic to, to get more knowledge about how they can just deal with, uh, with their challenging circumstances. Mary? Yes, and, and Ying, I'd like to explore the other aspect that I think you did a very good job of, of demonstrating in the film in a subtle way, the kind of pressure that he um, was under because he was really the light of his parents' life and uh, their expectation of him being successful provides a lot of pressure on a young man, particularly uh, when uh, so isolated in a new environment and, and within a new culture. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, Ying? So, in, so indeed, it's, uh, you know, Shi Ming uh, grew up uh, in China when, you know, when China just started, modern, you know, open modernization. And uh, Shi Ming uh, was part of the one child uh, generation. So he had the whole pressure of the family on his shoulder. And also in the tradition is uh, the son become the dragon. You know, that ideology that was also deeply uh, embedded in the whole culture, you know, as well as in his parents' mind. So, he, so his, uh, ex the expectation on him uh, from the parents as well as a from himself, uh, it's it's very a represent you know reflection of many you know uh, students from China, as well as uh, from you know other countries like uh, you know the parents send send their children to abroad to study, carrying all this uh, hope, and uh, yeah, indeed I think that uh, uh, that pressure uh, also contribute the part of his mental illness. Yeah, it certainly seemed that way to me as well. Dr. Guzder, what are the supports, if any, that are available to new immigrants in Canada or students, international students that come here to study? Well, those are two, actually two different questions because inside of universities, of course, there is a mental health service and so on. So one of the issues that you're bringing up is um, how cu culturally safe is it for someone to engage in those, uh, in those services at a time when they may feel very, very frightened that that could reflect on, on their legal process or their ability to stay or perform and so on. So there are, there are complex reasons why people resist access and, and cultural safety is one of them. So training people also who are gonna receive uh, international students or immigrants, really it has to increase. That is mental health itself has to relook at and primary care too, and how they engage their patient because many times people actually present with physical problems because that's safer rather than uh, psych psychological pro uh, problems, which are much more difficult to reveal and require more risk. So there, so there's that issue. Then there's a language issue. That is, I could speak English or French, but it couldn't. It could be far away from being uh, subtle enough or complete enough for me to really engage in treatment. And how many services are there that provide language services? Very, very few. And if I was not. Uh, an international student because there are, as you say, there are far more certificates for people who come to the country with temporary work permits or with uh, student visas. Those are the larger group rather than the people who enter through point systems at the, at the moment. So this is a whole other area that Canada is looking at. And we expect these people to be very competent because we have a success narrative about engagement. But in fact, uh, immigrant uh, children and families, especially post-war and so on, don't, they have great difficulty with access. They have great difficulty with language. They have great difficulty with advocacy, uh, legal, actual legal uh, advice. Like in this film, we had a wonderful lawyer who was remarkable actually. And, 
And in all of our services, by the way, uh, we always ask uh, migrants about legal aid and who is actually looking after uh, them and are they that is that person safe and competent? Because that's another aspect of the complications that happen uh, to people. And then there's the missions that people are sent with. They're, they may be psychological missions or emotional missions, or um, uh, you know, Ying was talking about the first child maybe having a specific gift, but a specific burden also that, that they carry with them. And so many, many uh, young women and men come to work and send money home. This is a part of the economy, actually, the reciprocal economy that goes on very commonly in developing countries. And so this is, an, again, the issue of not disappointing the people that we've left behind, whether you're from South America or Africa or wherever it is. And all of these things are impinging on your question. Uh, why would I seek mental health services if it means I'm weak? Uh, what is my concept of mental illness? Is it biological or is it because of bad luck or, or the evil eye or, or because of uh, something unfortunate I've done or I, my spiritual practice has not been complete enough? I, th so people have different kinds of explanations. Why do bad things happen to good people? How do I struggle and cope with misfortune? Uh, am I really welcome here? What kind of person do I have to be in order to fit in? Uh, how am I being welcomed into the society? And that becomes, again, very complex across the country because we have very different experiences in rural Saskatchewan or in Quebec or, or various other places. And we have to appreciate that each community and each context has to look at itself and own what kind of ways they, they make it welcome or not welcome. And sometimes those involve uh, discoveries and discussions amongst people. And this is becoming more common because of films like, uh, like this, that communities are having to engage with their own inquiry as to how they would make services welcoming. What is cultural safety? What is cultural humility? How do we accept that we have limitations in serving this population? Uh, how do we protect children? How do we protect young people? How do we make it uh, accessible? So these are, I'm presenting it as a series of questions because I think that is the engagement that the film is asking us to make. Absolutely, and you're outlining obviously a very complex situation and very nuanced depending on the kind of a story of, of that particular individual who's new to Canada and where they end up settling and what they're doing uh, will have an impact. But can you talk about what could and should be done to provide better mental health support um, to newcomers to Canada? Well, surprisingly, COVID has actually woken up institutions across the country. I would say that I have never seen so much interest in the, in, the, in the plight of minorities or in the vulnerabilities of minorities as COVID has uncovered. Um, now, so one of the issues is how do we use data? Do we have data to track whether someone who's newly migrated um, and how they're adjusting? Because we know that in the first generation people do better and in the second generation they have other kinds of issues which impair mental health. Um, and even out of KMH, which does fabulous research, they're saying, we really don't know enough about this area. We need more data, we need more understanding, and we need more research. And I think the federal government is now beginning to respond to this because COVID has made it very clear that there are definitely groups of migrants who are more vulnerable. And it may be because of the kind of work they have, it may be because of multiple factors and so on. And if we don't take responsibility for this uh, problem, it impairs our functioning as a society. So there's a kind of reciprocity of health and moral distress at what happened in America at the borders with detention and with separate, forced separation on the wall. So we're re actually facing a very exciting opening, I think. I'm very enheartened by it, that people are willing to talk about anti-racism. They're willing to talk about invisible barriers. They're willing to talk about systemic barriers, which are not always evident to us, that may be unwitting barriers. Um, how police and how social workers and how schools can be places of prevention and welcome. 
and how, uh, so all of these options, I believe are part of this discussion and are very, very important at this time. That's a fascinating observation. I also want to give Ying a chance to talk about what she feels that uh, should be done to provide better mental health support to immigrants and new Canadians. What do you think, Ying? Yeah, I think I want to uh, echo to Jaswa's uh, uh, talk is uh, the pandemic actually also uh, give, give everybody the chance actually to experience the isolation, the anxiety, uh, and uh, the sudden lose, the grief of a sudden lose of your family member. And, uh, you know, without you to be there to, to, to be with them at the last moment. I think not only immigration uh, population, uh, we are all experienced this. And, uh, and I, I think the, the, so we're all part of this, this being. So, so this is this family story, but this is also everybody's story. So to be aware of that is that we're all part of this universe, basically. I think this is important. Yeah, the awareness of that. Well, thank you. I, I, I also wanted to talk to Anthony because I, I, I want nonprofits in Canada uh, that work in the area of mental health and immigrant support who might be watching now, uh, who saw the film and are following our discussion. How can they work with SMI and the film, The World is Bright to build awareness and donor engagement and really open up a dialogue with affected people and bring change? Uh, Anthony, how, how can you work with them? What is it, what opportunities do you bring? That's a, a really great question. It's at the core of our work and I could talk about it for hours. So, but I will restrain myself and uh, just hit my key points. I think that one of the, the things that brings me the most joy in doing this work is simply introducing organizations to one another at these screenings, whether um, they are both panelists after the discussion and they receive these questions from the audience that reveal the commonalities that their activities have with one another. For example, you know, the Canadian Mental Health Association um, working with Mosaic to get more input from people who work directly with immigrants on how best to serve them, how to phrase, uh, how to create cultural safety uh, as Jasmine uh, very, very importantly pointed out. And then for Mosaic and other settlement agencies to look at the materials that the Canadian Mental Health Association is creating and, and doing some really hard thinking about how, how, which of these do we include in our settlement materials so that we are creating a space where they can explore this on their own, um, that they don't feel like they have to potentially risk some um, you know, social uh, social uh, consequences for, for asking questions about their mental health. So in that specific example, you know, both of these organizations are serving their constituencies, but by working together, they're not having to expend so much in terms of resources or capacity in order to do it. No organization should have to reinvent a wheel that's already working elsewhere. Is, is our dream. Our dream is that Story Money Impact by using these films can find across Canada, all these people who are doing work that is based on shared values, that is trying to accomplish the same goal. And we simply say, let's hang out, watch a movie, have this really nuanced conversation about what we're doing, share this knowledge about what is working, what isn't, and then move forward together and see if we can tackle different facets of it. So I think using films to, to simply meet other organizations is a big one, and especially for intersectional issues like this. And for those of you who've seen the film, you, you, you feel in your heart right now this connection to the issue. That is simply not possible just by reading a research paper or reading an editorial or watching a TV program that's reporting 
um, a segment that's reporting on, on this issue before it flashes to commercial. This film is going to live with you for a little while. And in that while, um, we feel that audiences are really more open to supporting actors in that issue like organizations uh, under charity villages like membership. Um, so whether that means donating or that means downloading your resources and sharing them on their blog or simply just going home and doing the thing that you've been asking your constituencies to do, this film is like that door that opens that is much easier for them to step through. And of course, Story Money Impact, uh, we work with these organizations directly. We work, we work with the filmmakers directly to build these holistic, intersectional, multi-sectoral partnerships and strategies for how we can all do that without having to take on extra work. Because we all know that nonprofits are under-resourced and over capacity. And our hope is that this film is a way that reduces that load, that opens doors easily. Uh, rather than having to be another project that you have to assign a staff member to. So that is, um, I think, the real joy of using film to do this work and uh, the unexpected leverage that it creates in the things that we are already doing. Well, thanks, Anthony. Um, I'd like to now ask each of you to provide any final thoughts or advice or observations that you'd like to leave with our audience. Ying, uh, can we start with you? Yeah, and uh, I feel art storytelling, it's such a powerful medium that uh, can touch our heart and through touching the heart that can reach understanding and the connection and uh, eventually make some change in the world. So I believe um, many audience, uh, they are immigrants and they, they, you must have a first-hand experience of a life of immigration. So I hope this film can inspire and also empower you to tell your own stories because it's only through us that our voice can be heard. It certainly opened up doors for me as well to be able to see the perspective of the immigrant experience uh, from inside someone else's journey. Uh, it really was extremely moving. I wanted to now go to Dr. Guzder to ask her to leave some final thoughts for our audience. Well, I wanted to thank Ying for making this film. I think it's a gift of imagination and uh, as I said before, um, COVID has given us an opportunity to rethink uh, what, we, what we are facing in our society in terms of keeping it healthy, in terms of actually promoting harmonious diversity that we're very grateful for, but actually is a project that's a working project, that is an unfinished, unresolved and challenging one. And we have an opportunity to listen to with some imagination to the issues that the story has brought up and to appreciate that there's always one more than one story and that we mustn't assume that we understand. We must, we must listen and we must look for the stories. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you. I agree. Uh, and Anthony, final thoughts? Um, I think my final thought is I really want to re-emphasize one of the most important things that Jasmine brought up uh, today, which is uh, something I often refer to as cultural competence, but I really love the words cultural safety and cultural humility. Um, these are things that can be difficult to implement if there's not an understanding of why they are needed. So for, for me, at least, um, this film I have seen it be screened for uh, a group of doctors or a group of uh, nonprofit uh, staff employees. And those screenings of 20 to 30 people have been as important to me as screenings of like 500 people in an audience watching the film because those people are gonna watch this film, see the importance of, of listening to someone's story, looking for the story and not making those assumptions. And they, have the power to take it upon themselves to make changes in their organization 
um, that are going to better serve their community. So I, I want to emphasize the importance of cultural safety and humility. And I would like to highlight The World is Bright as this great first step to screening that film for your staff um, or for your colleagues, and then beginning that conversation of how do we better serve our immigrant constituencies now that we understand some part of why it's important to do so. Uh, and so if anyone is interested in using this film for that purpose, they can contact Story Money Impact. My email is anthony at storymoneyimpact.com. Thank you, Anthony. And thank you, Dr. Jaswant Guzder, for your powerful insights and Ying Wang for your extraordinary film. And thank you, Anthony, for joining me to host our first Charity Village Presents video chat in partnership with SMI. Thank you to the audience for joining us. If you're a nonprofit working in the space and want to get involved with using the film and working with SMI, reach out to Anthony. If you're struggling with mental illness or are a new Canadian who needs support, check for the link at the end of this video for resources to help you. Thanks for joining the conversation and see you at our next Charity Village Presents with Story Money Impact. Thanks for watching. Thank mm -hmm. you.